look at government policies and how they've torn in our families apart, that you know this isn't what our families want. So we hope that we can address the men's issues, the women's issues and the children's issues and bring them back together as a family and strengthen that family where it's safe to do that. Vulnerable people will unzip that, look at me, because they're, they're unzipped to everybody. They're unzipped to Centrelink, they're unzipped to the docs officer, they're accountable to the courts, they're this, they're that. Some people are just, that's their life. So what we've got to do, we have, a co we, have a, we have an obligation to protect their vulnerability by saying, well, hang on a minute, she don't need to do all that. It's really important for Aboriginal people to make decisions on their own behalf. Um, it would be ideal to have that right from the top down. Um, Aboriginal organisations are where, um, you know, we, we generally have Aboriginal board members, we have Aboriginal CEOs ideally, and Aboriginal workers doing um, service delivery for Aboriginal clients. How can we expect parents to be able to provide an environment that's safe and secure if they've never had that environment mm. before? So, um, yeah, for me it's thinking about, um, yes, children's safety and security does come first, but how can we make the whole family have an experience of safety and security? Mm. And how can we make sure, I suppose, our service system is safe and secure so that people can then learn from that experience? And it's like breaking a vicious cycle. It's okay, my passing it on, my sister or someone went through and young kids see that and they think it's normal. They, it's normal and keep going. <laughs> they become violent themselves uh, to other children, mm -hmm. to uh, staff members of the school. They just lash out for no reason or they can be withdrawn yeah, and don't talk at all. Quite often children who have experienced you know, significant amount of family violence Will, will be delayed um, in their education, you know, mm. the, the trouble concentrating, the trouble of oh, being 15 minutes late or being, you know, getting picked up early or not being sure what's happening at home, so thinking about what's happening at home or not being really sure how to manage those positive relationships, so what do you do with that? What and are you not getting adequate sleep, not getting are going on sleep. in the night. Yeah, so, you know, who's concentrating on their maths and their English when they've got all of these things going on? And yeah. then you go, well, congratulations, now you get to go to a completely different school where you don't know anyone and start again. Yeah. The crisis needs of adults are very different to the crisis needs of children, you know. The crisis needs of an adult will be around, well, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't know what food I'm going to put on the table tonight. I don't know, you know, we've got, only got the clothes we stand up in. I don't know where I'm going to get my children clothes to wear to school tomorrow. That's right. And that's not the crisis needs of the child. The crisis needs of the child are, but my basketball grand finals tomorrow. But am I ever going to see my school friends again because, you know, little Billy borrowed my pen and I haven't got my pen back and, well, what's happening with the stuff in my bedroom? Yeah. And, yeah why am I not seeing dad anymore or grandma or my cousins and that's what the crisis is. They don't care where we stay tonight, it's a bit of an adventure staying in a motel or on someone's couch or... You've got to design yourselves to be a safe place, number one. And that's about setting boundaries like you do with that service who have a, who want to do something like that. Well, the, well these are the perimeters, um, doing a risk assessment on our work making sure that we're safe in how we conduct our business mm. and the families are safe when they arrive. So safety has to be within you, you and your organisation, even if it's about verbal, like how you communicate and how you talk to people, a way of um, talking to them about something or how things are done in a way that's not threatening or um, judgmental. All of our staff members have cultural awareness training yearly and it's an ongoing thing for non-Indigenous, oh, actually Aboriginal um, workers had to have cultural awareness training too which was, was blown away but you know I learnt something so that we're very conscious about our cultural obligations. They're coming through the door and they're handing their children over to Aboriginal people so they have this expectation that we know their kids, we're prepared for their kids 
we have more considerations about what their kids bring to the centre. I think it's just a friendly face, a friendly Aboriginal face. Mm -hmm. That's when they first come into contact with the service. Mm. Mm. So the fact that it's an Aboriginal woman who's supporting them yeah. is really important, you found? That's right. And that's what will sustain the, the place and make it safe is, is everybody having a play in it and, and owning it and the elders acknowledging it that um, it's, it's what they want and they still have a say and they, and they definitely have a space. That's really, really important. Aboriginal people. If you want Aboriginal people to do the business, you've got to accept that trauma is within our community, so it's within us. Mm. So we carry that trauma too. Mm. So how do traumatised people work with traumatised communities? Yeah. If you don't acknowledge that and it becomes uh, that that needs to be on the agenda, mm. Mm. violence and mm -hmm. removal and grief and yeah. dispossession and if you don't have that on your agenda for mm. how you're going to roll out your service or do be your business, yep. then a bit hard. It will work from a family therapy model. Mm -hmm. So it's that working on the systems, the systemic stuff within the family and strengths based. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. um, I suppose everything's underpinned by respect. Mm -hmm. So it's not around uh, labelling. Uh, I suppose not around blaming, but it is around accountability. Mm. It can probably be a little bit challenging at times for families to go through that journey, mm. but that's why we work as a team in supporting that family mm. through those challenges. People are reluctant to go to outside organisations because they're frightened of their children being removed. Oh, absolutely. We actually <coughs> attend a lot of community events if there's things going on here at Mullum um, and not only do we attend but we bring our children or in my case grandchildren um, and they interact with all the other members of the community so your face gets known they know who you are they know what kind of person you are before they actually even walk into Boondawan Willem they've, they've got a, a picture in their head of people and, and that's developed a, key, a trust. That's a key access thing that we talk to mainstream services about about attending community events and mm. becoming um, familiar mm. with community. And I know it, gets, it goes against the boundaries that mainstream uh, that sort of encouraged to keep in boundaries, mm. but um, you're not gonna break down those barriers if you don't. I find that with victims of violence, <coughs> often the mother is then seen as not acting protectively when she doesn't leave a violent relationship. But we know that in family violence that it's a cycle, a psychological cycle that they're caught in, but then the children are removed under those pretenses. And the poverty and past traumas are often not addressed in child protection matters. It's just kind of yeah. face value, caught, done. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we're finding with a lot of our clients that they're children of people who have been stolen as well. So that's a huge mm. component of when I say historical trauma, um, that's, you know, and I strongly believe that governments have a responsibility based on their past policies that, to fix that. Mm. If we don't help heal the men that are perpetrators, then they're going to go on, as you say, and, and revisit the cycle over and over. Mm. Um, so part of what our men's worker does is, <coughs> is work with healing, and that's what we're about, is to try and heal the hurt, to stop that um, violence coming into the relationships. The Brothers Day Out initiative that we ran a few years ago here at Mullabar, so we had two here, we've had one in Southern and in Gippsland, so that's working with Relationship for Australia Victoria, so they funded us to do a couple of men's um, it's kind of like a sister's day up but a men's version here mm. and when, when we're doing men's yarning circles actually in this room you know you would actually have men would start confiding and talking about their experience of actually being violent mm. so we actually had you know counsellors here as well to support the men so even though it was a social engagement day giving that men that opportunity to sit around in a circle they actually start to realise it wasn't just me having the same experience. Mainstream partnerships in our region are vitally important to the work that we do. We wouldn't be able to do it without those partnerships and it, 
It's through identifying champions within the mainstream organisations that can best support our communities, developing direct referral pathways um, and breaking down some of those barriers to make these environments safe for our communities to access. What we've tried to do as a, as a service, both with Safe Futures and with Wesley, is work with um, uh, the Aboriginal services in the, in, that are working within the community so that um, to, to work with them and to ask them what it is that they want um, and, and put forward some ideas and ask them what they want to contribute and, and how they want to go about that. I suppose as an Aboriginal worker it's very important that I continue to advocate for my community in and to mainstream um, services especially at mainstream services that receive specific, or specific Aboriginal funding when they run off and plan things and do things without collaboration or consultation. We're such a small organisation that we're actually um, competing for funding with much, much larger organisations. A lot of times the mainstream organisations will get the Aboriginal dollars, um, <coughs> but the Aboriginal people won't actually attend those and so a lot of the funding is being lost um, in mainstream organisations because clients won't go there. Programs are often funded and set up with 12 month pilots and you know, then we'll reassess and determine whether there's funding for another. You know, how can you plan for the longer term for your clients if there's no, if you have no ability to plan for your program. It will take a long time just to get men to even come to a men's group. So when you have funding mm. to run that group, when it gets to the end of the year, it's like, well, we don't have funding even for the men's position. So there's almost no men's role. So you've got all these men that are really keen that want to come to the group. You know, they're looking at you know, setting up calendars for the next month of you know, men's programs. And there might not be no money for me to even work there anymore. Sustainability is more than the building and it's more than I think it's about really staying solid and committed to something to either see it through or as through as you can go and then hand over and then you know nothing better to see than the community taking it over or who out there is growing along with it. We are accountable to community we have to be responsible to community and you know, that because people are in a, a higher power position, don't think that you can go and make decisions about communities' needs when you haven't spoken to community, mm -hmm. because in actual fact, you work for community. <laughs>